Testing, testing. Testing. Call the committee committee of the whole meeting for corporate council, October twenty fourth, two thousand sixteen, to order, and I will begin by asking Deputy Mayor Henderson if there are any additions to the agenda. Uh, Mayor Brockner, there are no additions. Okay. Are there any declarations of interest from members of council tonight? If there are not any. Ms. Brace, we can proceed. Your Worship, we have a presentation by Mary Mouton, landscape architect and Malcolm Warden, Chair of the Victoria Hall Square Phase 4 Ad Hoc Committee to present updates to the Victoria Hall Square Phase 4 design plans based on recommendations from the Victoria Hall Square Phase 4 Advisory Committee. Okay. Welcome, Malcolm and yeah. Miriam. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. You all know who I am. Uh, I'm the Chair of the Victoria Square Committee. And uh, I'm here to speak about the organization of the of the committee and the work that they've done and uh, Miriam Mouton will follow me and uh, show you the results of that work with the final plan of the project as we visualize it <coughs> it's uh, in June of this year I was pleased to hear that council had decided to complete phase four of Victoria Square as the town project to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday. I was honored to be elected chair of the committee assembled by the town to review existing plans and recommend improvements for phase four, which allows me to finish off work I started as chair of the original Victoria Square Committee, which unfortunately ran out of funds in 2005. We started that project in the year 2000, so it's taken a long time to bring this, this project on. Initially, I was concerned about the efficiency of a committee comprised of 22 members, but I, uh, I was uh, given those by the mayor. As we even had difficulty finding a meeting room big enough to hold our meetings, but I'm glad to say it's working out very well. I'd like now to refer to the members of the committee and to show the diversity which was achieved by getting, we had a large committee, but it was very diverse to get as many opinions from the, the interested parties uh, in the town and also the public. First of all, we have head of the list, Mayor Brockenier and Councillor McCarthy, two members. Next, we have town staff, Stephen Peacock, Dean Hustwick, Ian Davey, Glenn McClashen, Alison Tory LaPere, Sally LeBlanc, and Petra Hartwig. That's nine. We then have 10 interest group representatives. We have Elaine Asselin, Coburg Farmers Market Association, Richard Randall, Heritage Advisory Committee, Gudrun Ludorf Weaver, Planning and Sustainability Advisory Committee, Ken Jans Jansen, Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, Randall Ross, Environment Environmental Transportation Advisory Committee, Florence Fetcher, Fletcher, Victoria Operatic Society, Cheryl Blodgett, Accessibility Advisory Committee, Kevin Ward, Northumberland Chamber, Central Chamber of Commerce, Thomas Cowling, Coburg Economic Development Advisory Committee, and Jack Boy Agent, Northumberland Players, Fire Hall Theatre. And then we have three others, which is Miriam, our consultant, Jim Dowd, who was actually the engineer on the original project, and of course myself as chair. This committee has been meeting every two weeks since June, and due to the fight, we have established a tight timeline as the planned opening ceremony is scheduled for August 2017, which doesn't leave us a lot of time to do very much. 
<coughs> I'm pleased to report that we are right on schedule thanks to the hard work of the committee and our consultant Miriam Mouton. I have been particularly impressed with the innovative responses we received back from the interest groups through their representatives on the committee. These and also suggestions received at a public meeting have been included in the right into the revised plan, which has been unanimously approved by the committee and is submitted tonight for your approval. The committee has also submitted to council the following names as replacements for Victoria Square, which are Coburg Heritage Square, Coburg Market Square, Coburg Civic Square, and Victor Victoria Market Square. Councillor Deborah McCarthy set up a public art subcommittee comprised of herself and Stephen Peacock, Sheila Stewart, Jim Dow, Ken Jansen, and Richard Randall, Mike Dupuy. And they were to prepare terms for an artist competition for artworks in the square. This is an ongoing project, and I believe she will be reporting on that uh, next month. The members of my committee are very enthusiastic about this project and have all agreed to continue serving until it is completed. We are also considering a fundraising project, selling engraved pavers like we did the last time so that the public can feel a part of this project and have a place in Coburg's history. I'll now uh, let Miriam explain what our final plan, then ch what changes are compared to the one which, our preliminary plan, which was before you, I think, last August. Now, Miriam. Thank you, Malcolm. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and um, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you this evening. Have I got the microphone in the right spot? Okay. And uh, so there's a, a, a couple of audiovisual uh, materials that I would like to present this evening, and uh, we will start off with the video. Uh, the video was prepared uh, for the public meeting, and that was in the middle of September, and the Following the video, I will be showing you a PowerPoint presentation, which will also include some of the revisions from the feedback and uh, from from the public, from the, the and the committee itself. And then um, I will open that up to to any questions. Just to check in your council agenda, uh, you also received three pages of uh, summary notes prepared by myself in response to the feedback. There is a ex, uh, Excel spreadsheet which has the comments from the representatives on the committee as well as uh, questions and answers from the public meeting. And it's, uh, that's a detailed one. I'm, I'm not sure it was in your council agenda, but that is available through the committee secretary. Also part of your agenda this evening is the uh, latest version of the plan for Victoria Square. And I will um, have a chance to review that with you later. So we'll start with the video. Victoria Hall, named after Queen Victoria, was officially opened by her son, the Prince of Wales, in 1860. James Coburn, a father of Confederation, had a law office in Victoria Hall before becoming the first speaker in the new government of Canada. Victoria Hall has graced Coburg's Main Street for more than 150 years and is a heritage landmark of local, regional, and national significance. As Coburg's Town Hall, it continues to be the seat of local government, as well as a destination for business and arts entertainment. Victoria Hall is surrounded by an area known as Victoria Square, and within this area lies the Phase 4 project, Coburg's signature project to celebrate Canada 150. Phase 4 is the rebirth of a civic square, and demonstrates the town's lead role in downtown revitalization. In this aerial photograph, Victoria Square can be seen, bounded by four streets. Victoria Hall, the Fire Hall Theatre, and the Market Building are the restored heritage buildings located on the block. Phase four of Victoria Square encompasses the main civic space, shown in blue, a place for people of all ages to gather and to celebrate. 
In addition, programming and future operations will unify all parts of Victoria Square. Extra attention will be given to the four main gateways at the street intersections, including enhancement of the pedestrian crossings. In this aerial view from 1919, note the open space south of the hall, for many years a location of a farmer's market and gathering place for the community. In Coburg's past, its harbour and railway prospered. Today, Coburg is still served by rail and continues to have a busy waterfront with a popular sandy beach, waterfront trail and a small craft harbour. These are among many other recent improvements to public spaces and parklands. The project to update and complete Victoria Square will define the Civic Square as a people place and strengthen the connections between Coburg's neighbourhoods, the downtown and waterfront parklands. The Victoria Square Phase 4 plan is updated for 2016 from the original plan described in the 1999 Victoria Square report. As we travel south on 2nd Street, we can experience this important connection between the downtown and the waterfront. In addition to enhanced pedestrian access, the north end of 2nd Street from King Street provides vehicular access to the new east side development and occasional vehicular access to the main square when it's in business parking mode. Here, shown in market mode, the pedestrian connection to the waterfront with canopied walkway and inviting cafe seating is designed at a human scale. As we pass the gateway marked with public art and seasonal decorations like summer floral plantings, we arrive at the main square which is bounded on all sides by pedestrian oriented areas including stages for performing arts. Viewed traveling eastward along Albert Street, the flexible spaces along the street edges serve to expand pedestrian areas and to create a sense of place. The 2016 plan features improved design for pedestrians characterized by lively street edges and wide boulevards, shown in yellow. As a flexible space, the Civic Square can accommodate different uses and users at different times and will continue the tradition of a regular farmer's market. area becomes a pedestrian zone. In business mode, the central space becomes a parking area with access from Albert Street or south from 2nd Street, shown in orange. Additional vehicular access to service events is located along the north side of the market building. A main goal in design is to meet or exceed standards for universal design, which include accessible design and function for all. The updated design also includes sustainable development standards such as biofiltration areas and permeable pavements where surface water is absorbed into the ground, here shown in purple. In green, the trees and green spaces provide sheltered seating and quiet areas. Outdoor areas for events, including three stage platforms, in red, and their related service areas, in blue, are both indoor and outdoor. The market building will house a public meeting room as well as an office for tourism and downtown information. Public art, shown as darker circles, will feature prominently as part of the storytelling theme. Art will also provide creative wayfinding, suggested here in the mold locations. In celebration of Canada 150, our theme is storytelling. This civic square provides a platform to share our stories, our history and culture, day-to-day -day life, and our hopes for the future. Join us in Coburg. We invite you to participate in the story of our community. And while we're setting up for the PowerPoint presentation, uh, what I would like to uh, mention, some of the revisions from the September 15th public meeting include uh, the addition of, thank you, the addition of uh, street trees uh, on the east side of 2nd Street, uh, a couple of points with regards to potential other projects that may impact the, this particular one. 
um, the review of pedestrian circulation for the three main stages. There are potentially uh, three larger stages where performances could be set up, and there was a question from committee members, how, how, does, how do pedestrians maneuver around that setup? But I think that would be part of set up for those uh, event programming, for example. Also, potential foundation changes to the stage area at Fire Hall Theatre to accommodate a future add-on. And um, this is a, a, a discussion uh, between the town and, um, who, who owns the building and uh, the Fire Hall, or the um, uh, Northumberland players. And uh, I think that that is a, a discussion that's happening uh, in, in addition to. Also, the greening of the area between the market building and the ventilation building, which is the north side of the market building um, and the ventilation building for Victoria Hall. What I had added was planter boxes because it is a utility space. And one thing I've also added since the uh, last meeting of the committee was that there was uh, there should be some consideration for the generator, uh, which is uh, a, a, a necessary item for Victoria Hall. And also, uh, it's a, I, ha I must say that it's been a, a pleasure to work with the uh, committee on this, and ideas bring are brought forward um, and considered. And the item of a rental bicycle uh, operation, uh, that might be something that could be added to the square. So every meeting, there's one or two items that uh, get refined or, or um, uh, brought forward for, for consideration. So I'd like to start the PowerPoint presentation. Oops. And it's a right click for the next, for that one? Or is it a left? Yes? OK, it's a left. <laughs> So uh, what I'll do in the PowerPoint presentation is just to highlight some of the uh, changes. A bulk, the bulk of this presentation was also presented at the public meeting. Here are some uh, interesting facts about uh, Coburg and Victoria Hall and the area around Victoria Hall. And as you know that uh, Victoria Hall is a national historic site opened by the future uh, king. Uh, who was Prince of Wales at the time in 1860, and also James Coburn, a father of Confederation, was a f and the first Speaker of the House of Commons, had an office here in the hall. Queen Eliz Elizabeth visited in 1972, and the Governor General reopened the restored Victoria Hall. <coughs> Victoria Hall phases one and three uh, were w worked on er by the original committee and many of the principles from that time are still applicable. My job, my work in this particular phase, which was to update uh, the original plan, um, involved revisiting the, the best of the, the original ideas and updating them for 2016. Some of the features from the original plan, which still exist, and as Malcolm mentioned, the name pavers are quite popular. Over the course of time since the original plan, the Town of Coburg has made incredible effort uh, and investment in improving the waterfront parklands and also to strengthen con the connections between the waterfront, the downtown, and the adjacent neighborhoods. I wanted to add uh, some pictures to show that there are activities at night. And for example, the Buskerfest in the, in the two photos on the left uh, was in 2015. Um, the Christmas uh, magic, that is a picture of Christmas magic in Victoria Park, but as you know, it was moved to the waterfront, and I think there's great potential to carry the idea through to the downtown. The phase four design, uh, which is uh, identified as the 2003 plan, was what we started with. And back in 2003, it was ready to go, but it was never completed. So here are some pictures of what the area looks like today and how it's used. One thing that the committee did uh, was uh, to look for 
uh, ideas, suggestions from their travels from different parts of the world, and they were brought forward as well. This also included the idea of public art, and you may recognize the statue in the lower right-hand corner by a, a world-famous uh, artist, and that is located here in Coburg. Public art uh, also um, can lend itself to creative ideas, uh, such as there's a curly queue there, a bicycle parking, and uh, also interpretive signage to help uh, with wayfinding and also to um, share the stories of the community. I worked on the, uh, um, the master plan or the concept. The next phases um, are to work on preparing the detailed design drawings and detailed cost estimates. But that is a separate uh, item which Council will need to consider. Again, the project boundary. Now, what I would like to point out in this photo, if you look at the 2016 plan update on the right, is dotted lines which suggest parking layout. One of the decisions of the committee and uh, would point that out on the plan that is included in your agenda packages is that there's no parking lines. Um, it was felt very strongly, uh, the message that I received was that this really needed to be a public uh, people place and that we recognize that parking may be part of the program for this space, but the committee directed me to show the final version without the parking lines, but it in this PowerPoint presentation, I have indicated where the potential parking spaces could be. An illustrative sketch of the space as a people place. There are four main recommendations which I have been able to uh, pull together. And as I'd indicated earlier, there's a three page summary which is available as well as the Excel spreadsheet, which is a verbatim account of the feedback from the various committee members, their organizations, and also my response to those items. But uh, the first item, to create a pedestrian space, a people place without vehicles. This statement of intent guides priority of uses and users in detailed design. It was a strong message to me that this must be a people place. It must be designed as a people place. If you can fit in a parking lot every now and then for the parking of vehicles, that's great. It's, it ha it is, re despite the fact that there is an um, indication that this should be a strong people place, there is recognition that parking in the downtown is a valued commodity. The project themes which arose are of connection, accessibility, and storytelling. And this is where public art and creative messaging have a, a very important um, role. This is very much a flexible space. Uh, the, the different spaces, um, they also require servicing that can accommodate the various uses that can happen here. This, uh, perhaps the bollards would be able to hold posts to, to hold up shade sails, um, protective cover, other protective coverings, um, so that we need to build in the foundations to make sure there's enough electrical outlets. Um, other services like accessible public washrooms, and also to ensure the safe separation of pedestrians and vehicles. The use of lighting is very important to expand the programmable space and the programmable time that these spaces can be used into the evening, and especially it's Canada, the winters are dark, <laughs> and uh, in, so to lighten, lighten the areas uh, and, all, and also for safety and also incorporate innovative solutions, durable materials, and sustainable development standards as a demonstration of best practices. This includes uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, things like permeable pavements and so forth, which was also a direction from the committee. And some of the documents that were used in the background uh, for, this, for this study. Thank you very much for your attention, and if there's any questions. Well, thank you very much, Miriam. 
um, having been on the committee, I know I missed a few meetings, but I, I do know how much work you put into this, you know, between meetings to bring forward information for the committee. And, and the fact that you've been able, you know, been able to pull this together in a relatively short period of time and get consensus from 24 people, I think, you know, that's a, that's a credit to you, the way you, you know, the way you have consulted continually with the uh, committee all the way through the process and then guided us through all a variety of options. So I just want to say how much I appreciate you put into this project and I think it's, you know, something we can all, we'll all be very, very proud of. So now I'm going to open up to um, members of council who may have some questions. Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Worship. And Miriam and uh, Malcolm, thank you very much, as always, for an informative uh, presentation. I know, Malcolm, you mentioned uh, there may be an interest in uh, fundraising and the PAVER program, and I'm excited to see that because recently we've had a lot of new residents arriving to make Coburg their home. But also a point of consideration, I've had a lot of citizens uh, come to me who did the original PAVERs, where they're starting to uh, fade over time. And they've actually phoned me to request, is there any way they could have a new paper uh, redone in the memory of someone? So it seems to be an interest on both sides. So I'd, I'd leave that with you. Um, my only question is, um, you have an ambitious timeline. I can see the grand opening is slated for Saturday, August the 13th, a very appropriate day. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's James Colburn's, uh, maybe Mr. Franklin can help me. I think it's James Colburn's birthday. Pardon me? Okay. Oh, February. Sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Uh, so I am ahead of myself. My question is, if as we get closer, if you find that date is not working for a number of reasons, would you come back through to this council or just through committee to propose alternative dates? I, th I think that question is better answered by the CAO because he will make sure that as we go through the process that we're staying on time and on target. And you have Malcolm as well. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Uh, yes, um, after the experience of the CCC where we drove the process in 11 months, I think that this is ambitious but quite doable. Okay. Other questions, uh, Councillor Darling? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, for you to the uh, guest speakers. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you both for participating in this, and uh, especially Mr. Uh, Boardman for uh, sticking with it over such a long time, starting something in 1999 and finishing just short of, a couple years short of 20 years is uh, quite a time to endure and stick with I the project. Got a long list, so work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, thank you kindly, both of you. Any other questions? Obviously, it's, uh, it's been well received, uh, Miriam and Malcolm, so I think we can move forward from here. And there is an action item on the agenda tonight, yeah. so we'll be dealing with that later. Your Worship, at this time we have a delegation by Tony Farron, Rotary Club member, and Dr. Bob Scott, past trustee of the Rotary Foundation, requesting proclamation of November 25, 2016, as Rotary Foundation Day in the town of Coburg, to recognize the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Rotary Foundation. Okay. Welcome, Dr. Scott and Tony. Thank you very much. Uh, your Worship, members of Council, thank you for the opportunity to present our request that uh, 25th November 2016 be declared Rotary Foundation Day in the town of Coburg. Uh, we as a, a Rotary Club are going to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the founding of Rotary Foundation on that, on that day. Now the mission of the Rotary Foundation is to enable Rotarians to advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through the improvement of health, the support of education, and the alleviation of poverty. And I know you're thinking, boy, that's a, that's a pretty broad statement and, and a big aim. Um, but over the last hundred years, We've done this through educational exchanges, agricultural and clean water projects, 
and very specifically the worldwide mission to eradicate polio. It has dispersed almost one billion, one billion dollars uh, towards these aims, plus encouraging Rotary's 1.2 million members to uh, actively involve themselves in, these, uh, in the completion of these projects. Now, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Dr. Bob Scott. He was uh, past chair of the Board of Trustees of the Rotary Foundation, and he's going to describe highlights of the Foundation's work. Thank you very much, Your Worship, and members of Council. Thank you for listening to us tonight. Uh, I, as a word of explanation, the Rotary Foundation is the charitable arm of Rotary International. Rotary International was founded in 1905. The foundation came into being in 2017. And I'm always glad to say that decision was made at the international convention that was held in Edinburgh, which is a town I know rather well. We have six main areas of service, as we talk about, plus the polio eradication effort. We talk about, first of all, disease prevention and treatment. And uh, I, in, in your uh, papers, you will see we've given some examples of this. And uh, the Rory Foundation fam fam funded Family Health Days in Africa in 2015 and uh, to places where there's never been a doctor. And I've traveled to many of these places and can see the benefit that the foundation does. Water and sanitation is probably the biggest thing we do after polio. Uh, there are more clubs involved in this than anything else, and note the word sanitation. Uh, it's all very well to give clean water and uh, put in um, toilets, but we have to teach the people how to use the toilets. And those of you who may have visited India and other places similar, um, you notice that the toilet is very often the main street, and so we have had uh, to teach people how to use a toilet. Basic education is, ob is an obvious one that we should be involved in, and we have many ways of doing this, including giving uniforms, which are not used very much in North America, I know, or in Canada, or even in Coburg, um, but uh, in many parts of the world, uh, once the child has a uniform, the pride in the parents is amazing. Economic and community development. Uh, the big one here is microfinance uh, loans. And uh, it is interesting that approximately 95% of the money we give to people who are maybe illiterate comes back to us. And we have very, very few poor debts. Economic and community development. Interestingly enough, this is the one that's least popular amongst Rotarians, and I'm not quite sure why. Uh, they, they'd much rather uh, help a, a child who is starving than help a community be able to run itself and be able to treat the starving child in a proper manner. And so we're doing a lot of education to Rotarians on this particular goal or area of focus. Peace and conflict resolution. Ever since we started really, uh, this has been one of the main thrusts of Rotary International and its foundation. And we have been very involved in, as you see from your notes, as early as 1914, uh, the Rotary Convention adopted a resolution that said, lend its influence to the influence of peace among nations of the world. And we've had many peace conferences and run many peace conferences. And we're very involved in the startup of the United Nations um, in Los Angeles 70-some uh, years ago. And uh, there was uh, leading Rotarians who helped write the constitution of that um, organization. And in fact, today is United Nations Day. Uh, I gathered from a, an email I received from someone else because it leads me to the Polio Plus program. That is the one I think probably most of you have heard about. It's the one that has helped our foundation gain some traction amongst the press 
and others. We're not very well known. We're not like the Red Cross, etc., and yet we give out billions of dollars. And this year we're aiming to raise $330 million amongst the 1.2 million Rotarians. And it, it concerns us that we don't have as much publicity as we should get, or we feel we should get, and therefore our request uh, for uh, the declaration of a Foundation Day by a Rotary, uh, by the city of Coburg would be tremendous. This is also polio, World Polio Plus Day, and in many communities, including huge uh, uh, celebrations are going on in Toronto with lighting of the tower, etc., which I might have been at, but I thought it more important to come and talk to you folks instead. But uh, we are very close to eradicating polio, having put in now $1.4 billion, that's Rotary money. The whole project will cost about 14 to 15 billion at the moment. I, my personal thing is it may get as high as 20 billion before we finish. But there are only 25 cases this year, 27 cases, sorry, of polio worldwide. And they are in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and also in Nigeria. When we started, we had a thousand cases a day. So, Your Worship, we are progressing, and our foundation is the key to the whole thing. And I hope you look on us with favor and let us have a foundation day in Coburg. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Scott and Tony. Th Dr. Scott, thank you for, well, we're in Coburg, we're all very familiar with the community projects. We've been the beneficiary of many, many rotary projects in I mean, you can drive anywhere in town and see where Ro Rotary has made a, you know, a, a community contribution. Uh, most of us are aware of the work that, you know, is going on with polio, uh, and your your goal to eradicate polio on a on a global basis. Uh, but not, we didn't know to the extent how much, you know, advancements you've made there. So it's good to know that, as well as all the other global initiatives that you have just identified for us. So very much appreciate the fact that you're enlightening us as to all the global work that Rotary is doing, and um, we appreciate it very much. So now I'm going to open it up to members of council who may have a question. Uh, Councillor Rowden. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Scott, and, and uh, Tony, that very good presentation. It runs in my mind that uh, we had polio in this country in the 1940s, and, and Dr. Scott, you would likely remember some of those things that happened in this Do I look uh, that old? Yes. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you're just about my age. Anyways, uh, what I was going to mention was that there was we had a uh, gentleman that was a neighbor of ours and had polio, and it, it meant that people were crippled for life, a lot of them, and that formed. And I, and I know he went on to be fairly successful in this area, a fellow by the name of Larry Hall. And it's only through not only medicine, but people like yourselves that have made this possible in the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years. So I'd, I'd like to make it personally. Thank you for the work you do as a Rotary Club. Thank you. I knew, I knew Larry well, of course. Okay, Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for outlining the six areas of emphasis of your work. Um, I, too, have worked for uh, n um, charitable foundations, and um, you're right, getting the message out there that what you do, and I'm wondering, in, in terms of your infrastructure, if the foundation has um, got a marketing, social media staff member, or is it like, is there some support to getting the message out, or is this completely volunteer based? No, we have a huge staff. <coughs> We're worldwide, as you understand, and um, we claim 185 countries, and so we need a professional staff, and that is in, in Illinois, in Evanston, Illinois, where our headquarters are. Uh, we send out stuff in seven different languages, so obviously we need a large staff. And in fact, at the headquarter building, uh, right at this moment, we've got about 600 employees, which is heavy. But when you uh, uh, consider the seven languages that we have to put everything out in, it, it increases the staff numbers and does increase the cost a little bit. But we're also very, very proud but every dollar that is donated today will be spent three years from now. 
the interest and the, that we get on the funds donated uh, is used to run the organization, to run the foundation. And uh, yes, we really do need a, 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 a professional staff to help us. Deputy Mayor Henderson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Dr. Scott, perhaps I'm very familiar with what we do at Rotary, but perhaps you could share with Council the uh, role that the governments play along with uh, Mr. Bill and Melinda Gates. Yes, um, it's interesting you ask this question on Polio Eradication Day because, of course, we've all been uh, trying to remember how it all started. Uh, when we started uh, in 1979, Rotary started the idea of eradicating polio. We did it purely on a volunteer basis. And our first, uh, we were very bad at math. Uh, we set a target of 120 million US dollars to be raised, and we raised 247 million. Uh, very bad at math. But we continued, and it struck us that obviously we weren't going to be able to do this on our own. And at that time, uh, one of our uh, staff, professional staff, suggested that we should start uh, going to governments to raise money. And this was about 1988, 87, maybe a little later, early 90s as well. And uh, Rotarians were terrible. They didn't like to, to publicize what they were doing in any way. And that's why it's taken all this time to come to you folks and ask to have a, have a day, uh, because we didn't like that. It, it was bad form to publicize what you were doing. But then right after some discussion at the board, the Rotary International Board, uh, this Rotarian was allowed to go to some governments. And he did, but then he discovered he couldn't possibly do this all on his own. And a group was formed called the Polio Advocacy Group, and this was uh, in 1996, uh, uh, if, uh, if my memory is correct. And uh, it was uh, WHO, UNICEF, um, uh, United Nations Foundation, Ted Turner's Foundation, uh, and Rotary. Nothing to do at that time with Bill Gates. And uh, that was very successful. And that group, with Bill Gates on site now, has raised approximately $12 billion. Uh, to eradicate polio, only for polio. The Canadian government has been extraordinarily uh, kind to us. Uh, we're number three in the world in Canada. I'm talking US dollars all the time here, by the way. And uh, we come behind the United States, who originally gave us $11 million, and we chased them pretty hard, and they now, now are way up, giving us about 125 hundred. Uh, last year they gave us 156 million US dollars. Canada is third after, after uh, US, uh, UK, and we are third. We're ahead of many other countries who expect to donate money, such as Japan. And we've had great difficulty with J the Japanese, but we work with all the governments, and thank you for the question, because we couldn't do it without the governments. And Mr. Gates came on site about 10 years ago and having his organization behind us has been a tremendous help. I've dealt with the man personally on several occasions, and he's a hard bargainer, I can tell you. But he is determined to eradicate polio as well. But please, uh, Your Worship and members of the Council, please don't think that the foundation is polio. Polio is separate. The foundation are the other six areas of focus which spend a lot of money too. Uh, we're hoping to spend about um, 230 million this rotary year, which is between 1st of July and 30th June next year. And uh, our target is 300 million income. This is over and above polio. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, other questions for Dr. Scott? No? Well, thank, thank you very much. and. Uh, as I said before, you know we're we're really uh, we're we're proud of the work that uh, Rotary is doing globally, but we're also very thankful that you have a very very strong presence here in Coburg. Your Worship, under General Government Services, we have an action for this item. Deputy yep. yep. Mayor Henderson. The action recommended that Council proclaim November twenty fifth, twenty sixteen as Rotary Foundation Day in the town of Coburg to recognize the 100th anniversary 
of the founding of the Rotary Foundation established to enable Rotarians to advance world understanding, goodwill and peace through the improvement of health, the support of education, and the alleviation of poverty. Okay. You have a motion. Any further discussion? Having heard Dr. Scott, I don't think it requires further discussion. All in favor? It's carried. Your Worship, under General Government Services, we have a letter from the Ministry of Community Safety and Correction Services regarding the funding allocation and renewal of the Court Security and Prisoner Transportation Agreement with the Town of Coburg for 2017 and 2018. Okay, Deputy Mayor Henderson, I'm passing the chair over to you. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'll read the recommendation that Council direct staff to prepare a bylaw authorizing the Mayor and Municipal Clerk to execute an agreement under the Court Security and Prisoner Transportation, known as CSPT program, in order to receive the funding allocation for 2017 and 2018 as indicated in the funding agreement correspondence, and this is something that we do on an annual basis. If you have any specific questions, I would encourage them to be directed to Mr. Davey. Are there any points of clarification from members of council? Mayor Brockenier? Uh, yeah, Deputy Mayor, Chair Henderson. Um, I just want, just a, not a question, but a comment. Um, because over the years, uh, the provincial fun funding for court security has come to the county, and then from the county, through the county to us, because there are several, several other municipalities where they hold provincial court. And I've just been advised recently that there will no longer be any other provincial courts in other municipalities. So all the, the court funding that's coming to the county should come directly through to the town of Cook. Okay, that's new information for us, so thank you for sharing that. Um, that's very important information. Uh, Councillor Rum? Uh, this will be directed to the worship, then. Uh, in regards to that, is, are the Brighton and the uh, other court, uh, Port Hope and that being closed, and all the all the court cases are coming to the Coburg Courthouse? That's that's what's going to happen, yes. Okay, and, thank uh, you. And, uh, but and you also have to realize that the uh, the amount of um, provincial courts that were held there were very very few compared to what were was taking place in Coburg. Exactly, and I've been looking they at that. They would represent only like a small percentage of what we were doing. I've been looking at that have been amalgamated for many years now, and I wonder why it wasn't happening. Thank you, Your Honor. Any other points, clarification, Councillor Darley? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, just a question. This is a, a portion of the fee charged, I'm assuming. Uh, do we have a total on what we're paying out for court services? I'll refer to Mr. Davey, our treasurer. Uh, yes, I'd have to uh, look that back up in the budget book. I don't have that figure in front of me. Okay, I'll look forward to getting that in the future. Thank you. Mayor Brockner? I just wanted to, yes, if I may, Chair Henderson. Um, so what, we had an agreement with the county several years ago that they would give us a certain amount of money each year because to recognize that we had already, you know, we, we had all the costs for court security. And so along with the, the what the county had been giving us plus this uh, annual allocation, we, it doesn't completely cover the cost of court services because we're up around, I, I believe it's, Five hundred and fifty thousand dollars, somewhere in that in that neighborhood, and uh, so we, we haven't fully recovered all of the costs yet. But we're getting we're getting close. Any other comments? Hearing none, I uh, call for uh, acceptance of this recommendation. All those in favor? Against? Carried. Sorry, moving on to item two. Uh, memo from the Chief Administration Officer regarding Victoria Square Phase 4. Uh, the action recommended, I spoke with the CEO earlier, and it was placed under my portfolio, General Government, because of the allotment of finances. But in speaking with Mr. Peacock, I indicated I would like this part in particular to be passed over to Councillor McCarthy. And the reason being because Councillor McCarthy has been involved in every step of every one of these motions by her involvement in this committee. So I'll be happy to answer perhaps any 
questions related to funding or Mr. Davey, but I would like uh, Madam Clerk for uh, Council McCarthy uh, to take this recommendation on. Council McCarthy. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm going to uh, place the recommendation on the floor and uh, then we will uh, entertain questions or discussions and uh, there, there many, many staff members were involved, but the lead, of course, is our CAO, um, Stephen Peacock. So, action recommended that council endorse the recommendations of the Victoria Square Phase 4 Ad Hoc Committee and accept the final design provided in the staff report as a basis for final construction drawings and tender package, which includes an information package. And further, that council accept the project timelines as outlined in the staff report. And further, that council appoint the existing Victoria Square Phase 4 Committee to act as the Victoria Square Project Steering Group for the next phase of this project and further that council direct staff to proceed with the preparing and processing a request for information and a request for proposal for the public art component of the Victoria Square project in the amount of approximately $10,000 to include a stipend to request for proposal proponents and any costs for professional artist expenses on jury panel and Further, that the final award be contingent on budget deliberations and the success of grant applications to funded uh, app grant applications to be funded from the 2017 pre-engineering amount, and further, that council direct staff to proceed with tendering and execution of engineering and architectural services for preparation of tender documents and plans at an estimated cost of 40000 to be funded from the 2017 pre-engineering account and further that the call for construction be contingent on budget deliberations and success of grant applications and further that council authorize that Miriam Mouton landscape architecture Tech architect be retained to provide advice and direction as required on an hourly rate basis and further that council select a name for the vi for the square from the options suggested by the committee reviews as follows first choice Coburg Heritage Square second choice Coburg Market Square third choice Victoria Market Square fourth choice Coburg Civic Square there's quite a bit in that motion. I just would like to make one small change. Um, it's in the one, two, three, the fourth, the fourth section. We actually renamed the request for information to an EOI, meaning an expression of interest. It doesn't change the intent of that uh, part of the recommendations. It just has a different title. So replace request for information bracket RFI with expression of interest bracket EOI. And um, because we've received a presentation from uh, the project lead and committee chair, um, I'm going to ask CAO Stephen Spe uh, Peacock to say if uh, he would like to share some comments and then I'll open it up to questions. Director or uh, CEO uh, Peacock, do you have anything else you'd like to add to the presentation and the recommendations or would you just be available for questions? Um, I can add a few points. Uh, I, I think that uh, the committee is working very well together. Um, there's a lot of synergy around the table. And I think that the community is well represented on the committee by all the different aspects of the membership. Um, the, um, please note that the, uh, uh, you'll see a difference in the cost for engineering services in the uh, at attachment to the report. The total cost of engineering is approximately 100000 on a budget of $1.3 million. Uh, the 40000 here represents preparing the plans to a point 
where we would then know whether we have the the grants from the government and whether we're going to proceed so the no further amount would be it's, uh, spent until that point was reached um, the stuppance would be for the phase four uh, or, or for the second phase of the art uh, um, uh, call in the second phase would, would be for up to four uh, artists who would be picked by the jury to submit mar marquettes for that work so I, I'm quite uh, I'm willing to answer any questions if anyone has any concerns Thank you, um, uh, CAO Peacock. And I, just before I entertain questions, um, the chair of the committee, Mr. Wardman, was explaining the members of the public art subcommittee. Uh, we also, following the uh, protocols and spirit of the public art policy, we um, sought membership from artists or people with a background in the arts in the community and I'm happy to report that uh, David Acomba, a resident of Coburg and founder of the Port Hope Jazz Festival, was a member of the uh, Public Art Subcommittee, and Sheila Stewart, who is um, very, very involved with the Art Gallery of Northumberland and um, was on faculty at Ryerson and is, uh, has phenomenal knowledge of our permanent collection. Uh, they were appointed, and as well, we were able to have the advice of Felicity Pope, former chair of the CAPS committee, which is currently retired, uh, Coburg Art and Public Spaces, along with the other members that uh, Malcolm Wardman suggested who were already members of Victoria Phase. And we really had to work by tight timelines, and I want to thank uh, CAO Stephen Peacock, who pulled together a really um, a, an, ex, uh, a pro, an RFP with teeth and good uh, common sense that the committee went through. So that's all I'll comment. Uh, first question, Councillor Robin. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Councillor McCurney. Uh On the amount of 1.3.67, uh, 267,000, uh, are both the federal and the provincial government getting, uh, will have applications for grants? And the other question would be, have we included the uh, Coburg Taxpayers Association as any committee members? Are there any of their membership on the committee? That I'll ask uh, um, CAO Peacock to answer about the grants, and then I'll answer about committee membership. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, federal and provincial uh, request for grants is approximately 800000 of the total. And those grants have all gone in, uh, the requests, and we hope to hear from them by the end of the year. And as for the terms of reference for the committee for Victoria Square, the intent was when council passed the uh, terms of reference to was to have a representative from each advisory committee, as well as the organizations directly affected by the Victoria Square project, and that would include Northumberland Players, um, and Victoria Operetta Society because they have their productions in Victoria Hall and the Farmers Market. Um, Community-wide groups not directly associated with the Market Square or not an advisory committee had an opportunity to provide input because there was a public meeting for the Victoria Square Phase 4 uh, presentation earlier and comments were provided. I'm not aware if the the Coburg Taxpayers Association weren't a delegation at that public meeting. There may have been members there that provided questions, but no, they were not included as uh, members uh, in, ter in our terms of reference. Mayor Brockenier? Yes, uh, Councillor McCarthy, and uh, this isn't a, it's, I'm not asking for an amendment to the motion, but the motion does call for council to select a name for the square based on four recommendations from the committee. Um, there's no hurry to do that and no process identified. So I'm going to suggest, and it, it doesn't have to be part of the motion, that uh, we do it. We will also post it on our website so we can get feedback from the public and see what the general public is thinking about the names that have been proposed. Uh, thank you for that uh, rec that recommendation. Uh, indeed, uh, 
that's uh, what the committee was thinking, was that council might open it up to public input. So um, that's perhaps can be added at, um, let's just say, further that council select a name. Uh, further that, could we add, uh, Your Worship, further that council consult the public in the selection of a name, but we won't say first choice. We'll just put the names out there. All right. Thank you. Is everybody comfortable with that? And <laughs> well, you can say about you can. It will come back to council, obviously. Um, but just to put in perspective, there was voting by our rather large committee, and that's how it played out. Um, and Coburg Heritage Square was first by quite a few, and then the middle two were kind of close, and then the uh, fourth one. But there are many more names. So um, uh, just some advice from the town clerk. Should the mayor add an amendment, or can I just add that in to the motion? Okay. Would you mind making that amendment then? I, I'll, I'll, I'll make. I didn't really think it needed an amendment. You know, it was just something we could do as a follow-up. But if if, a, if an amendment is, you w if you wish to have an amendment, so it's written, then I will make that amendment that uh, that uh, council. Council put it out to the public through our website for consultation from the public. And just to say, there is no hurry, but um, oh, sorry. Did you? Well, okay. We won't worry about process. Are there any right? Any yes? Any discussion on the amendment? Yes, Councillor Dowling. Yes. Um, I'm just going to say the mayor stole my thunder there. I was going to suggest the same thing in that I think this is a, a good idea that we do go to the public. I fully support the amendment. For the discussion, I'll call the question for the amendment to open the uh, the name, the choice of the name to the public. All in favor? Uh, no one's opposed, so that carries. I won't read the motion again. <laughs> We just know that it includes we're going to consult the public on the name. Any further questions about the motion now as it stands? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? There being none, the recommendation carries. Thank you. Your Worship, we have Parks and Recreation Services. Thank you very much, Ms. Brace. Uh, at this time, I have a memo from the Director of Recreation and Culture regarding the Town of Coburg Arena's utilization report. Um, the action recommended is that Council accept the interim facilities utilization report and further that staff report back to Council by the end of 2017 with a full utilization report and recommendations on all three facilities and further that council approve option three as outlined in the staff report for capital improvements to the Coburg Community Centers Cafe designed to improve overall food and beverage services at the facility and further that these funds be allocated from the Northern Park Reserve in the amount of 160,000 plus a contingency allowance of 5% if required. Now if I may, uh, Director Hostwick has created uh, quite a lengthy report here um, the gist of it is for the utilization of our arenas, um, being uh, the CCC, the Memorial Rink, and the uh, former Pad 2, which is the Curling Club. At this time, um, with all the events in future, we're going to have to uh, probably make a brief decision on the uh, Memorial Rink and the uh, WCN, which are in the report. But the big issue is furthering our beverage services, services at the CCC. We've had lots of complaints from people that is very limited, uh, from larger uh, potential customers that there's no kitchen facilities. Um, this was all looked at in the original plans, but due to the time frame and a few other things, uh, it was thought that maybe it was uh, a little too much to take on at the time. And uh, so, We've come back to look at this, so I would like everybody to, to, that has read the report to seriously consider it. And I'll ask uh, Director Huswick at this time if he would uh, give us a bit of a Coles Note version on it all. If you would, Director Huswick, if you would please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd uh, be happy to. Um, it is a lengthy report, as you have pointed out, and I'll do my best to try to be brief, but I think uh, my comments will probably still be a little lengthy in order to hit the high points because it is, uh, there are a number of important issues in here. But the origin really stems back to 2015 when the former Director of Public Works brought forward a, a report to Council focused mainly on the memorial uh, arena but uh, did discuss uh, the Jack Heenan as well. And uh, Council has asked for an update on, uh, on that for 2016. So the objectives of the report uh, were, uh, were a number. Uh, wanted to dr address some public perceptions or misperceptions on some of the issues, uh, provide uh, preliminary utilization data on the three facilities, uh, clarify some of the, uh, the steps ahead and, and timelines for decision making on, uh, on uh, all three facilities, as well as to identify a number of opportunities for improvement and to recommend a number of uh, immediate steps. So I think in terms of perceptions, um, there's a reason that recreational facilities often do not turn a profit. Uh, it's difficult to compare private uh, uh, um, and profit-driven organizations uh, to public entities. Uh, the performance measures are, are uh, very different. and. That's because governments and, and public entities are really highly focused on the types of issues like accessibility, uh, affordability, and diversity that private uh, uh, profit-driven organizations uh, often don't have to address. And um, so there have been some perceptions around uh, the level of subsidy for the CCC since it's been built. Uh, there have been some criticisms that the subsidy is too high. Uh, we've done a little bit of research, and uh, unfortunately it's an American publication, but it, it came out this year. Um, there's obviously uh, uh, similarities between Canadian and American uh, governments and uh, recreational facilities. And uh, the report uh, by the National Recreation Park Association um, in, uh, in dealing with the agency performance benchmarks identified that typical uh, um, entities like uh, like ours subsidize the recreational facilities at a rate of about 71 percent and uh, I'm happy to say that the uh, Coburg Community Center is only uh, at 45 percent so uh, a much uh, better performance than uh, indicated by that study. Um, I'm not going to walk through chronologically the report, but I'm going to try to touch on uh, the key items uh, facility by facility. So I'm, I'm going to begin with the Coburg Community Centre. Um, when it first uh, was developed uh, and built in 2011, um, obviously it, it has created enormous new exciting capacity uh, for this community in terms of being able to uh, offer uh, new activities. So. Since it's opened, uh, there's been a number of very significant uh, entertainment and sporting events, including um, large concerts by Blue Rodeo, Tragically Hip, professional hockey games, and certainly you're all familiar with the, the uh, World Junior A Challenge. Um, in 2017, we have three other very large events that uh, the community is hosting, and the CCC is playing a, a very significant role. Uh, that uh, would not have been uh, possible uh, without the CCC. We obviously have the Ontario Men's and Women's Curling Championships, followed by the 55-plus uh, Ontario Winter Games, and uh, then uh, the RBC Cup. Uh, there have also been many important uh, community events and activities, such as the, uh, the one just this past week and the Seniors Active Living Fair, Safe Communities Wellness Expo earlier this summer, uh, and, and many others. Uh, recreational programs is a, a very significant addition that has been uh, generated because of, uh, specifically because of, of the CCC. Uh, recreational programs were not being uh, delivered by the town previously. We have more than 2,500 children, youth, and adults actively engaged in programs being offered at the CCC. We have a senior center that has grown dramatically uh, since, uh, since it was developed. We have over up to 900 members uh, with over 40 weekly programs, which is uh, 
uh, quite a dramatic uh, development uh, in a few short years. Um, another uh, important aspect of the CCC is its role in emergency management. It's identified within the emergency management plan as a shelter in the event of uh, any uh, major emergencies, which is uh, always very important. Uh, hopefully it never has to be used, but it is an important facility in the event that something like that uh, transpires. And, and I could probably go on and on, but uh, I just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, the community is very different today than it was before the CCC existed. So in terms of utilization at the facility within the report, uh, outline uh, some rates, and I'll just very quickly. The bowl during prime times around 80% on average. Non-prime time ranges between uh, 26 and 30 plus percent over the last two or three years. The pond at prime time also about 80%, non-prime times around 50%. Now, um, I think these are decent rates. Uh, if they were at 100%, we'd have no capacity for growth of this community. So you, you don't want to be at 100% because if you are, you're, you're planning a new facility. So uh, prime time is, uh, is very well utilized, but still some capacity. Non-prime time, which is normal for as people are working most of the time. Um, still has uh, uh, lots of opportunities there. In terms of the, the warm side, and I think what's really important is, I think some people see the CCC as an arena. It's not an arena, it is a, a major community facility. The warm side, we have uh, 10 different uh, uh, facilities, including gyms. Um, we've averaged them out for 2015, and depending on the charts listed in the report, depending on the room, they range from anywhere from 17 to 45 percent. And that's uh, averaging prime time and non-prime time. So obviously during prime time, the numbers are a little higher, but I think uh, the fact is that uh, there is a considerable opportunity for expanding the, the use of those, uh, those rooms and uh, enhancing programs which again is positive because uh, uh, as we had done, as the community grows and as needs uh, change and evolve, uh, we have an opportunity to start addressing those and, uh, and enhancing programming. Now moving to food and beverage services, um, as the chair mentioned, um, there have been uh, some ongoing criticisms. They certainly became apparent as large events were being held with thousands of people. Uh, the canteen and bar in the upper bowl was added after construction, I understand, to start addressing um, the, uh, the, the large lineups and, and demand, but uh, criticisms have continued in terms of hours of operation, the product selection, ongoing lineups, and uh, as well as uh, um, a lack of uh, prep kitchen. It's very difficult to have large events and uh, when uh, you have no capacity to uh, really prepare food, which often is done on tables in some of the other rooms. Um, the criticisms led in 2015 to an online survey to assess uh, users' uh, um, uh, beliefs regarding food and beverage services. We had over 400 respondents, which was very positive for uh, a survey like that. 40% of respondents said they used the CCC three times or more, which is pretty impressive. 75% use it between uh, really prime time, 5 to 11 p.m. 8% uh, always purchase products, 36% sometimes, 25% never, and of those 25%, 88% said it's because of a lack of variety, and the, and, and the selection is very limited. Um, if there was greater variety, 55% they said they would be very likely to purchase products, and another 38% said they'd be somewhat likely. So overwhelming response that uh, uh, better selection, better hours uh, would lead to uh, 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 happier customers and, and enhanced revenue. Um, the food and beverage uh, um, services at the CCC uh, are already profitable. In 2015, there was, uh, we've estimated about a 50% profit. Um, so that's uh, contributing significantly already, even in its limit ca limited capacity. So we believe there are opportunities to enhance the customer experience and satisfaction and generate additional revenue. At the memorial, built in 49, rebuilt in 52 after a fire, utilization uh, is used between September and March. 
Uh, it's mainly used by uh, hockey groups, and it's only staffed during prime time uh, and unstaffed uh, at other times. Utilization rate during uh, the hours that it's open is about 70%, 70 so still quite heavily used. The off-season, uh, when the ice is out, it's used as overflow um, for uh, the CCC, pr predominantly lacrosse. Uh, condition assessment, structural assessment was done in, uh, in 2011. I have to apologize, the report actually says 2013, but we've, we finally pulled it out of archives and it was in 2011. Uh, identified no major deficiencies, only minor uh, recommended repairs and regular inspections. A number of upgrades would be required in order to continue to use it on an ongoing basis, and it's important to note it's not a, a fully accessible facility. In terms of the future, uh, um, we are, as you know, in the final stages of completing a recreation strategy and implementation plan that is looking at programming, and that needs to be considered before decisions are made on the memorial. I understand the county will also be doing a utilization uh, study uh, area-wide, looking at different facilities. Those two have to be reviewed uh, um, jointly. And, uh, and of course, in 2017, as I mentioned, there's uh, large events, and uh, the memorial will be overflow uh, in, uh, for those events in 2017. Uh, in addition, certainly as the division evolves, uh, we're going to be pursuing uh, activation of facilities more, developing new cultural and entertainment opportunities for the community, um, pursuing a sport tourism strategy, and, uh, and as we enhance utilization, the, the potential need for over, overflow could uh, increase. So those are all considerations for Memorial. In terms of Jack Heenan, Built in 76, uh, utilization was also, um, um, we don't have stats because it's been leased out since 2011 to the uh, West Northumberland Curling Club. That expired in August, so we do, uh, we've had discussions with them. We do, we will be bringing forward a, a short-term lease extension, and, uh, and that will be uh, important to allow the curling club to continue and to focus on the curling championships early next year and after the championships, then they can uh, turn their attention to the future needs and priorities, and then we can engage in discussions about uh, what their wishes are with the facility as well as what the towns would be. A um, number of upgrades uh, have been noted in there for ongoing use as well. So in terms of conclusions and recommendations, I've, I've outlined a number there in terms of some preliminary strategies that at the staff level we've identified for uh, enhancing utilization as well as generating new revenues. And I'll just uh, quickly go through those. those uh, there's quite a number, but I think they're important to highlight. In order to increase the number of regular patrons, uh, we have a number of strategies, organizing more concerts, cultural events, activities to broaden the use and attraction of the CCC throughout the year, enhancing recreation programs related to the recreation strategy. Uh, marketing programs much more vigorously to increase awareness and to ensure they are all at full capacity, as well as uh, really um, understanding the needs, the programming needs of the community uh, much more thoroughly. Uh, potentially building a loyalty membership program, developing a sport tourism strategy, as I mentioned, and looking at uh, enhancing our corporate business strategy. In terms of extending the length of time patrons stay in the facility and the amount of money they spend, uh, looking at scheduling programs that align and encourage consecutive use rather than people coming in for a half hour or an hour and leaving, looking at how we can keep them engaged in, in the facility, enhancing the ambiance in the facility with more passive activities, and that can include uh, many different things, but you know, uh, photography shows, art shows, really utilizing uh, the full potential of the facility. And one of the most important ones for the recommendations tonight, improving the facility's food and beverage services, including selection, hours of operation, and the speed of service. And acquiring a permanent liquor license for the, for the facility that provides much more flexibility and revenue generation. Uh, and uh, that has been discussed with the police service, and, and they are supportive. It actually helps for all types of events instead of having to go through special event uh, permits all the time. We have a ongoing license. Um, continue the conversion of the Grand Hall into a real lounge atmosphere for uh, ongoing uh, enjoyment and use. 
and expanding the product offerings of the pro shop so it's not just hockey focused but meeting the needs of, uh, of all of the users and, uh, uh, and becoming uh, much more relevant for the facility. So in terms of the specific recommendations in the report for uh, food and beverage, um, they are they're designed to meet the needs of the events being held in 2017, uh, moving the CCC uh, more towards its original vision of becoming a community and cultural facility, um, enhancing customer service and experience, and that's, those are, are key themes of the new division and enhancing profitability of food and beverage uh, at the facility, which obviously uh, will have a, uh, an impact on the bottom line of uh, the operating budget. So we have uh, three different options listed in the report. We have a, a, a minimal one, which would simply, uh, option one simply adds an additional uh, small deep fryer, which is only a one to two uh, um, uh, person capacity, so, but the cost of, uh, of uh, actually connecting that to fire suppression and, uh, is a total of about ten thousand dollars. So a significant investment. Um, you know, if more than if more than three or four people order something, even with the second piece of equipment, it's going to result in a lineup. Doesn't expand the the selection at all. Option two for approximately seventy five thousand would add about a uh, an eight by ten foot area that would uh, come out of the current pro shop to add a grill and deep fryer, which would uh, uh, enhance selection somewhat in terms of burgers, fries, and, and other uh, fried foods. It doesn't provide any additional prep area, so uh, broadening this selection beyond that's going to be difficult. But for uh, an additional um, 85,000, it would, uh, option three is a major expansion of the cafe, taking over the existing pro shop creating a large kitchen with uh, um, uh, a wide uh, selection of uh, potential offerings and a full prep kitchen that would not only meet, meet the needs of the kitchen but also meet the needs of large events that are held at the CCC. And, uh, and the pro shop would be relocated uh, um, to, uh, we've actually identified another potential spot within the CCC, but we have two other options of relocating that. So the full uh, estimated costs uh, of option three are approximately 160,000 to come from the uh, Northam uh, 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 Park Reserve. And uh, we've confirmed with the treasurer that uh, the funds are available to cover those costs. And I'd like to point out that uh, there is a next item that uh, this was reviewed verbally with the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee last week. They had a very uh, robust uh, discussion and uh, there was a unanimous endorsement of option three that uh, you'll find in your package. Uh, there was a strong belief that uh, this was overdue and would, uh, would achieve the types of objectives I've outlined in the report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Hustwick. Okay, at this time I'll entertain any questions from Council in regard to this issue. Mayor Brock in here. Uh, uh, Chair Darling, yeah, I'd just like to make a comment. As, a, as someone who's up at the CCC a lot, um, I have two grandchildren that play rep hockey, and uh, so I, I'm up there when teams are coming in, teams are leaving, tournaments are on, and so on. <clears throat> so if we're making, if we're netting $50,000 a year now with what we call a bare bones service, there's no doubt in my mind that if we go to the $160,000 option, and we can probably double the amount of service that we're going to be able to provide um, the many people who visit there. The, the routine is that teams, coaches uh, like to have the rep teams come an hour ahead of time to have a talk, do warm up and so on. So the parents come in, they're at the canteen while they're and getting and buying, you know, buying whatever it is, coffee or, or, or something to snack on. And then every time the game is over, all the players are rushing up to the uh, canteen to get the service they need and all the products they want to buy. So I think that, um, you know, given uh, that there will be a, uh, a payback on this, uh, the $160,000 isn't just going in a, in a black hole, you'll see that money come back and it'll probably be paid for, you know, within about uh, 
it'll pay for itself in about four years. And I think it's the right thing to do long term for the CCC. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mayor, for your comments. I do agree as a fellow hockey fan for grandchildren. Um, if they come out of the dressing room and there's no food for them there, the first place they're off to is uh, one of the local fast food joints. So if we can provide it, I'm sure it would be a great benefit. Uh, Councillor Rowden? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'm the same. I agree with the Mayor here. I've been at the arena quite a few times and have been lineups, but I, I don't know when you'll ever solve the problem of a lineup. Uh, Tim Hortons have expanded for many, many years, and they still get a lineup now. If you get a good quality of food and you get good quality service, you'll end up with good. And those are the kind of things we really got to look at. I, I don't mind spending the money, but we do certainly got to look at the service and the quality and what they're going to get for the money that people are going to be spending. And then likely the other thing would be to ban people bringing their own drinks or food in if it's available. I don't know whether that's possible at all, but <laughs> those kind of things you see a lot of people bringing their own stuff in, and, I, and I've done it myself because I didn't think the, the canteen would be open, but if it's open longer hours, I don't see why the people shouldn't uh, accommodate it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rowden. Um, Councillor McCarthy? Thank you, Chair Darling. Uh, I have uh, two quite different questions, um, and I'll, I imagine uh, Director Hustwick could help on answering first on utilization. Um, we've heard quite continuously the success of the seniors um, being involved in memberships, but you would look at the utilization rate of their room and think, well, what gives? It has a 17.2% utilization. Uh, my question is this, um, because a senior center, I'm gathering that when you say there are 4,740 total hours available for use, but only 816 are used, does the 816 represent book time? Because I know that center is also used as a just a drop by and, and hang out, um, and so if it's just scheduled programming and there's a sense of using it more carefully, would that perhaps mean actually um, having that space available for other groups who need space to meet but are not necessarily part of the seniors' plan programming? Uh, thank you. I would have to agree with you. I'll have to go to Director Hustwick on that as he has all the available numbers and uh, data to back it up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure I have all of the available <laughs> numbers, but uh, I believe, uh, and that's one of the reasons it's called an interim utilization report, is because we still have uh, uh, a fair bit of analysis to do in order to dissect all of this data. But I believe uh, um, that is uh, booked, and I, can, I will double check this uh, tomorrow, but I believe those are like booked activities in the facility. Um, so people do come and go, but there's a lot of time that it is vacant. And uh, I know um, um, it is a seniors center. I do know the, the, the draft recreation study, study did comment on the opportunity for expanding the use of facilities, including that one, but obviously we have to be sensitive. And, but um, you know, working, I think, with the, uh, the members of the, the, um, of the center, uh, there's always opportunities, I think, for better utilizing facilities, whether it's theirs or others. Uh, again, I think it comes down to partnerships and, uh, and how we work together to meet the needs of the community and to, to better activate that facility. Because, uh, for example, on Friday we had uh, the seniors um, fair and the large hockey tournament. And I'll tell you, it was really exciting to be walking through the halls with the place full of people. And we want to do more of that. We want to make sure that uh, there's more activities like that uh, on the warm side as much as possible and getting as many people going through there and working really hard to better market it and promote uh, all of those activities and programs. And thank you. And I'll just a follow-up comment before I ask my next question. Um, I agree, partnerships are critical, and that, in fact, I believe programming could expand, particularly as we move towards our cultural master plan. And I think embedded in this report is the concept of 
recreation and culture uh, because that actually becomes part of active living, so uh, time for social activities and engaging the brain. Um, and it's not just about uh, fitness and uh, those kinds of activities, which is what I think the public thinks of the CCC, but I, I agree, I see it as a community center. My second question is pretty straightforward. The one word I'm looking for in option three for the kitchen, because it seems to open all the doors, is, is this going to be a commercial kitchen? Um, because that also opens up options for programming, actually. You never know. I mean, I know we want to have um, it to generate revenue, but that seems to be uh, something that's needed in a center that wants to have all the options available for providing food uh, and meeting the health um, unit standards. So is the intent in option three, what, would it embody what is known as a commercial kitchen? Um, yes, I'm pretty sure when we uh, discussed this report this morning that uh, the, the report uh, on the kitchen was designed by Hendricks, who are commercial kitchen designers, and all the equipment going in is a uh, commercial kitchen grade, but again, I'll confirm with uh, Director Hustwick on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to uh, um, Councillor McCarthy. Um, I, I guess it comes down to the definition of commercial kitchen, so it would certainly be a commercial quality kitchen for the CCC. Uh, it would involve prep space for catering. Um, it would not necessarily be designed to cook large convention type dinners um, so in, it, it would not be a commercial kitchen from that perspective but it would be certainly enhancing the capacity and selection of, uh, of, uh, of meals at the CCC and allow caterers to come in and prepare those types of large uh, large meals but uh, in terms of actually producing meals on site for hundreds of people um, I think that might beyond the scope of this? Uh, and just for the, to that, uh, uh, yes, I agree, but it, it's also um, having the infrastructure in place to meet the needs of the health unit um, so that an event can occur uh, that allows for um, food and beverage for uh, who knows, a private event w that, that may generate income like our concert hall. There's a lot of weddings there. Um, I see that as another opportunity down the road only in, in regards to the utilization rates. I, I think we have to think outside the box and kind of look at all opportunities because once this becomes a community center, I think people will begin to see the possibilities for a location. Because think about it, it, it and I'd like to think most of the citizens of Coburg have had an opportunity to visit the CCC, but in just in case they haven't, that, that lobby with these major pieces of public art with a very welcoming fireplace, some uh, lounge furniture, it is a place. It is a place maker. And a community center begins to draw people just to want to be there and thinking really outside the box, how about a library extension there? Who knows? Everybody's in that place. And uh, I know from being on the library board, um, their, um, their statistics indicate that the building is 20 years old, the capacity is almost there, and they have to start thinking of expanding or, uh, or rebuilding. So I really believe that the CCC with this right, and, and I do support option three, can open up doors and allow us to make this a center where, I remember when I did the community campus plan, at that point people were saying there was 22% usage of the CCC. I do see the potential for 60, 70%, and uh, that's what we should be aiming for. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor McCarthy. Um, I think Councillor Sherwin, then uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Thank you, Chair. Just a comment and then a question um, to for Mr. Rowden's comments there. I was in an arena on the weekend. Their canteen was always busy, but I also witnessed young families who are on the edge of budgeting for their kids to play sports have a, a meal by themselves that they brought in. 
I don't think that's a very good idea. I don't think we should even think about it. Young families are going through quite extreme measures to have their kids play sports, to ban food from coming in, just sandwiches. I think it's a, it's a bad thought and let go of it. My question is back to the alcohol permit. With that permit building wide, where does the liability f fall? Does it fall on the town? Are we the one with the permit? Or does the individual groups have to apply through us to do this? Where's the liability? Um, it is my understanding that we as a community would be applying for it, but uh, again, I'll, it, it's just in the uh, preliminary stage at this time in investigation, so nothing has been uh, put in concrete yet, but again, I'll confirm with Director Hustwick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, to Councillor Sherwin. Um, we would, uh, I think there, it would probably be a combination, even though we would have an ongoing uh, sort of permanent liquor license. Uh, if depending on the types of, of uh, bookings and and activities that are being uh, proposed, uh, we may still want the organizing group to obtain their own liquor license. So that's certainly something we've discussed, um, so that the liability is more on the organizer and the renter as opposed to us. And but it also I think comes down to the types of services that the CCC would be providing for those types of activities. So, um, you know, if we are providing, I mean, I think the, the intention is we're moving towards a position where we provide uh, food and beverage services for renters and we maintain the profits from those activities. Um, so I think it would be on a case by case basis. Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through Director Hospic, I believe I had the answer, but I'm going to ask it again just for clarity for myself. In terms of the amount in option three, I, I believe that includes both the enlargement or the enhancement of the food service, and at the same time it deals with the relocation or newness of the shop for ice skating and the like. Is, is, that, is that, is my assumption a correct one? Mr. Chair to the Deputy Mayor, that's correct. Uh, we've included uh, funds for uh, both the uh, um, complete conversion of the full space into the new cafe and the relocation of the uh, current pro shop. And we've looked at, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we originally looked at one location. Um, we're now uh, looking at a second potential location, but the funds, we believe, uh, we've estimated it should cover either one of those locations. Mayor Brockenier. Yeah, thank you, Chair Darling. Uh, I just want to go back to the uh, utilization report. And uh, just for clarity, I want to make sure that I understand it, and everybody understands that uh, when we're basing the total available hours at 4,745, like if you divide that by 360 days out of the year, you're looking at 13 hours a day. And uh, so that, you know, that's a, a significant amount of time that's available. Not many, not many places are using uh, the, the rooms or the activities seven days out of the week. So to Councillor McCarthy's point that 17% uh, seems fairly low for the senior center, you've got to remember that they aren't using it. They're never using it on Saturdays and Sundays. And a lot of their activities get extended out into the chemical room, uh, A, B, and C, where the actual activities take place. So you'll see that the actual utilization in, uh, in Gym A and, and Gym B actually go up, even though uh, to show that they are being used a lot by the seniors on a daily basis. So I, I just don't want people to get the wrong impression that uh, you know, the seniors are only using the, uh, the facility 17% of the time. When you take a look at, as I said, 13 hours a day over over 360 days, that's a lot of time that we have to fill and we have to start working on weekends because a lot of, even the meeting rooms don't get used on weekends. They get used mostly on midweek. Thank you, Mayor Brockner. Councillor Rowden? Uh, just a quick uh, comment on the regards to your liquor license. I think if you were to check with Hamilton Township Administration that they can tell you they've had the... Uh, the license on Baltimore and Butley Arenas for quite a number of years now, and I think it's worked out very successful as a profit towards the arena, and 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 never had any problems that I know of. Very good, thank you. Uh, any more questions at this time? 
Um, just before closing and asking for the vote, I, again, I want to reconfirm the fact that uh, the uh, the profit this year for the food and beverages, and uh, we're talking fifty thousand dollars from a very small canteen, a small canteen upstairs, and the vending machines. Um, again, I agree with the, the Mayor Brockenier. I think there is a huge room for potential here in, in increasing the revenues, and I think this is uh, even though it sounds like a lot of money. Um, when we built the CCC, it was first uh, discussed around the 30 million mark, and uh, it got cut back to 27 million. Maybe if we had spent that extra 3 million back, then it'd be the creme de la creme. But now I think adding this uh, this 160 thousand to improve the facilities will uh, stretch off long into the future. So at this time, I'd like to ask for the vote. All in favor? Uh, opposed? Carried. Thank you. Councillor Rowden, you now have the <coughs> chair. Worship. I have one item on uh, public works services tonight. Uh, it's a memo from a chief administration officer regarding the purchase of an asset management software. And I believe that the report is there, but the action recommended that council authorize initiation of the asset management program in the fall of 2016 with the execution of phase one of the project being based on the time timing requirements of the provincial regulation and further that council authorize the purchase and implementation of ESRI uh, Canada Asset Management City Works Extension in the amount of $10,300 and City Works Service Request API at an annual cost of $7,800 to be added to the existing license required for service request integration. Uh, a solutions website and city work service request integration in the amount of $9,750 and further building audits estimated at $45,000 for the total cost of $72,850 which includes building of the asset registry, completion of the building audits and integration of the town website service request system and city work service request system to be funded from the hold coal dividend reserve. And uh, the, these, this is something that the government has initiated that we have to go ahead with an asset management order to get funding in, uh, in the future. And uh, if this is uh, uh, proceeds, uh, we will have a, a system where it's, it's the same as having a reserve st a study on a condominium that you have uh, everything in place that you know what you have to fix and have to do on a yearly basis up to it a length of approximately 30 years or better. If there's any questions, we have uh, Mel here and the others. She's good with the uh, the type of system we're getting, and uh, our director of public works is here. Any questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't have a question. I just know that there was a case where the City of London had this kind of uh, program in place. Um, it recorded everything they were doing to the nth degree, and they had a, a major case going to court law, which cost them multi million dollars in a lawsuit. And in reading that particular lawsuit, it basically was thrown out of court because of the detailed assessments and tracking mechanisms that they had in place that c could prove to the plaintiff that uh, uh, their, cl their claims, in fact, by the court were false. So even though the City of London spent uh, certainly more money than we're spending, ultimately, in the long run, it saved them a multi-million dollar lawsuit in the courts over the winter period. So to me, I see this as the way of the future. Um, we know the provincial government's going to mandate this, as you already indicated, for any funding coming down, both uh, provincial funding and perhaps related to federal. So to me, I'd, I'd rather be proactive, and I believe Town of Coburg is. I'd rather be proactive and support this and build this into IG, GIS systems that Mel does such a great job through all of Northumberland on. I think it just puts, just puts Coburg in a very positive position moving forward. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, any other questions? Oh, uh, Councilor Darling? I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm going to put Mel on the spot here or not, but I'm just wondering if, if maybe she could give a brief explanation for us in regard to how the GIS interacts with this asset management. I'm sure she can. I might have something. <coughs> I'm obviously a lot 
much shorter than the last person. Um, early in 2014, I came to council to present our progress with CityWorks, actually, which we had implemented in 2013. Um, in that presentation, I actually hypothesized, sorry, right in front of it. Is this good? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I had hypothesized in 2014 about the many ways that I thought we might expand our use of the system. And that same year, 2014, we had a major expansion into the building and planning departments uh, with the permits, land, and licensing module of CityWorks. Uh, those departments have very actively joined public works and forestry in their use of CityWorks. Um, the memo that you, or the report that you have today outlines another significant expansion of our CityWorks uh, um, system and our GIS um, into asset management. CityWorks helps us organize our work specifically related to an asset. So if we're doing maintenance on a sidewalk section, say, or a manhole, um, now we have time and money and potentially materials associated with that work that we just did and with that manhole cover or that sidewalk section. So just to jump ahead of um, myself here, phase two of the project, we're actually going to see that, that data about the, the life cycle of the asset run through three uh, models in GIS, um, and the result's going to be critical decision-making reports and, and maps in short our asset management plan. Um, with our ever-growing GIS database and the dynamic inputs that decision-makers like yourselves are interested in might be uh, we, we get a large chunk of money for, for some sort of funding, or um, maybe we want to run a scenario where we say we want the, you know, the b absolute best for our assets for the next 50 years. Um, no matter uh, what the input is, um, our asset management plan is going to be a living document. We can run that scenario anytime we want. Uh, now, we didn't only look at CityWorks and Esri. We did look at three softwares. Um, Aesthetic, which is a web-based asset management modular software. Um, and then Esri's CityWorks extension and data models, which are GIS-based. They will sit right in. Um, one, one's an extension that sits right in our CityWorks implementation, and the other are data models that sit uh, right in our GIS platform. Um, uh, the third one that we looked at was VFA Facility, which is another um, web-based modular sort of an option. Um, I think the report includes a spreadsheet laid out a number of major categories that we uh, were looking at in the cost reach. Basically, the, the reason that um, I highly recommend going with Esri is that the other two require data duplication and decentralization of our, our spatial data, which we work so hard to centralize. So it's kind of counterproductive to decentralize it when the goal is to have one you know, living warehouse of data for, for all staff and the whole corporation. So phase one is going to see us continue to build out our data using the CityWorks Asset Manager extension that basically turns our existing database into a formal asset register. It uh, gives us some tools to better, better handle uh, assets like buildings and facilities and fleets that are less spatial than road networks and and uh, sewer networks, but c still we can still have the opportunity to have them sit in GIS. Um, not only does it form our register, but it actually opens up the prospect of all CityWorks functionality of service requests, work orders, and inspections to be related to buildings and facilities and fleets if we want. Uh, for example, Environmental Services is actually interested in using CityWorks as a, as a work order um, software, so that's just going to continue to maximize a license that we're already paying for. The, the cost is not going to change. We, we already, you know, we have unlimited um, licenses, so anybody can use it. Uh, the other part of phase one uh, that you will have noticed in the report is integrating the website service request module with our CityWorks service request module. So right now, um, the, the service request workflow as service requests come into the town, a service request being like somebody calls and I answer the phone and they tell me that there's a problem somewhere or somebody sends an email and says, hey, there, there's a problem, a crack sidewalk or whatever the case may be. That's a service request. Basically, we're having it duplicated. People can send an email, uh, send a, a request through the website or they can call and, and somebody at Public Works or Parks may put in a service request into CityWorks. Now we have two systems running side by side, but not talking to each other at all. So we've got duplicated effort, um, and what, what integrating these two systems would do is just streamline the workflow for staff so that issues are addressed much more efficiently. 
uh, and without any duplication. And you might be wondering why we think this should be part of an asset management program, but basically the CityWorks service request process is the first step of the CityWorks process. Um, a service request will often lead to a work order or and or an inspection, and efficient in integration with the website would help us solidify input from the public as part of the town's asset management process. Any questions? Uh, thank no. you very much. No. I just I just wanted to say, Mel, uh, thank you. Um, after reading this and then hearing your explanation, it's much easier to understand, but the public doesn't always understand exactly how and when it's explained and uh, the way you did it makes it a lot easier. And secondly, the fact that tonight the Committee of Whole is being uh, recorded, uh, we don't have to call you back here next week to Council because it's on code, you're going to have you go through <laughs> this all again. So I think, I think it's a double benefit of you coming here tonight and explaining this. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mel. Any other questions? Councillor McCartney. Thank you, uh, Chair Rowden. I don't think this is for Mel. That was a terrific explanation. I, I think I kept up with it. <laughs> um, um, to whomever could answer this, um, I'm understanding that this request is coming through. Um, uh, it wasn't part of this year's budget, but it's it's moved up in priority uh, relative to, say, being considered uh, next year's budget because of the activities of the new mandate of the Ontario government and the meetings that were attended. And my question is this. If this request was part of next year's budget, would it come through this, would it go through the same funding, namely hold coal, or would it be more of our tax levy? So basically I'm asking, are we paying for this through hold coal because we have to do it now and it's not covered off in this year's budget? Or would the funding for this kind of initiative come out of um, those funds anyways? Uh, CAO Peacock? Yes, uh, historically we've actually have funded uh, asset management from HOCO in the past. Um, the, um, the other thing that's happening is uh, you will be, re, uh, be receiving information on, with regards to the uh, development charges update. And we have this year been able to uh, uh, work with the consultant to include some uh, recovery for uh, asset management from the DC as well. So that would be new people coming into town paying uh, their share of joining the system through a development charge, and that would, uh, inc that would help that budget. Okay. Any other questions? I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Carried. Okay, Councillor Sherwin. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, before you tonight, you have a memo from the Bylaw Enforcement Policy Coordinator regarding amendments to the Exotic Animal Bylaw Number 59-2004. Now, I'll say one thing under action recommended. I'm going to shorten this up a little bit. And action recommended will be that Council authorize that the Town of Coburg Exotic Animal Bylaw Number 59-2004, as amended, remain in effect with no revisions, and that further that. Council withdraw the request to amend the Exotic Animal Bylaw Number 59-2004 based on the fact that issues raised are appropriately addressed in Section 3 of the existing bylaw. Now, as you read through the bylaw, I think the animals are well protected. The town is well protected. I think we've done everything we can to make this bylaw airtight. In saying that, there is always some circumstance that pops up, and if there is, we'll deal with it at the time. Any questions? Councilor? Er Mayor Brockenier. Yeah, uh, Chair Sherman. So I, I do believe the, the individual that you referenced, uh, I did have a conversation with her, and uh, she wasn't entirely sure that um, all traveling zoos or exotic animals would be exempt or would be, would be banned from the town of Coburg uh, until she understood that it was CASA, uh, CASA authorized or certified uh, exhibits only. And uh, so once, once she understood that, she was quite satisfied with the way the bylaws were written. McCarthy. Thank you, um, uh, uh, Chair uh, Sherwin. So this emerged uh, this summer uh, at the DBIA. There was uh, an exotic pet um, presentation, and um, I'm satisfied that the bylaw will cover off any um, opportunities the DBIA might have because uh, it, the, it, we brought it to their attention, and indeed, they, uh, as a group, they would absolutely want to respect uh, 
the intent of our bylaw. Um, the question was, um, and uh, the delegation that was made about concerns for animals, more likely something like a petting zoo for domesticated animals. Uh, certainly the care of the animals is of concern, but that they're not exotic animals, and so those opportunities will remain. But absolutely, uh, it's important that if any of these exotic animals come through town in whatever way that the organizations bringing them in are members of CASA. And I, I bylaw is good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Burkett. Last but not least. Okay, first off, we got a, a memo from Planner 1 regarding a notice of complete application for site plan approval, block 92, uh, Lonsbury Drive, Alt Row, Stallwood Homes. Action recommended that council receive the application and refer the matter to the planning department for a report. Any questions regarding this? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. I have another memo here from Planner 1 regarding a notice of complete application for site plan approval, 60 Monroe Street, EHCS Inc. The action recommended that Council receive the application and refer the matter to the Planning Department for a report. Any questions regarding this one? Uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson. Um, I'd just like to ask for clarification through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, Mayor Brockenier, is this the one that relates to the application from the county? Mr. Chair, uh, so it was the, the application of the county was from uh, Retirement Life Homes, which is not, not the same that is, that is listed here, although I do believe uh, maybe maybe they've, they're using a different name because it's the location that um, they were they were proposing for the investment in affordable, affordable housing. Perhaps, Mr. Chair, I could ask uh, Mr. Franklin for clarification. Just if it is, I thought it'd be nice to for the community to know the connect if if there is such a connect. Mr. Franklin, could you comment? Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, uh, through you to. Uh, the committee chair, uh, yes, very much so. This this is uh, a, a revised name for retirement life communities. Half of this project is designed specifically around the funding received from Northumberland County for affordable senior living, and the other half of the project is to be uh, market rate uh, seniors housing. It's an expansion to an existing approved site plan. Uh, the townhouses were already built on. Uh, Monroe Street, and this is those two apartment blocks in back behind that are currently vacant, backing onto the train tracks. Uh, they're higher buildings, um, and they're currently uh, been circulated amongst the staff through the development review team, and are we're expecting comments back uh, very shortly because we know that this project is underneath a very tight timeline with which to uh, spend the monies for the grant from the county for affordable housing. Any other questions from council? <laughs> see, see none. All those in favor? Carried. Your Worship, we have a closed session for this evening. Deputy Mayor Henderson. The acts recommended the council meet closed session in accordance with section 239 of the Municipal Act SO 2001 regarding personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. In this case, discussion will, will center around the Coburg DBIA board members. All in favor? Carried.